Hi, this is Tony Williams, a senior fellow with the Bill of Rights Institute, and welcome to another episode of Scholar Talks. Today, it is our great honor to be with distinguished scholar Forrest Neighbors, and he is going to talk about his new book, From Oligarchy to Republicanism, The Great Task of Reconstruction. So by way of introduction, Professor Forrest Neighbors is the chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of Alaska at Anchorage, uh, coming to us from, from quite a distance. Uh, and he previously taught American government and political philosophy at Oregon State University and the University of Oregon. Prior to becoming a professor, Dr. Neighbors was a, a high tech business executive in Portland. He has remained actively engaged in supporting economic and civic development in his communities. And from oligarchy to republicanism won the American Political Science Association's Political Thought Hook Award. Uh, Forrest, uh, I wanna thank you for joining us and congratulations on the uh, book award. Thank you very much. I, I'm glad to be here. Great, great. Well, you know, I, I really love this book. I, and, and the reason, a couple of reasons. One is I just learned so much from it. And, and I, I learned to look at reconstruction uh, in, in, in a very different way. Uh, and, and your book provides that new interpretation of that really critical period in American history. And so I guess where I wanna start is uh, since your book provides that new interpretation, what is what is the typical story of Reconstruction, and and how does your book provide a new way of looking at things? Yeah, thank you uh, very much for that question, Tony. the The received wisdom, which comes from scholars on Reconstruction, is that uh, if this is a struggle for citizenship in a democracy mm -hmm. and that reconstruction is about an attempt and uh, the adversaries of that attempt to expand American citizenship so it's more inclusive. And uh, that the premise of that view is that America is a democracy is you know was a democracy and had been a democracy to use the modern 21st century denomination of our political system. And what I'm saying is that is not true. We're missing a great deal. That story is not accurate because in fact, the Americans who established the United States in 1776, you're inheriting really institutions. I, I mean, they, they had been part of a monarchic empire um, and, and that the, this upstart area of the British America, New England, is really revolution central in 1776. They wanna build a republic and a re Republican system. They break away, form this country. And then, but you know, the Southern part of that new American Republic it starts to reform in a Republican direction following New England, but then something goes wrong. And what goes wrong is that the grandsons of the Southern Republicans, they become principled oligarchs. Hmm. That's when you, anytime you see in the 19th century historical record, a, a, some one of these statesmen avowing the goodness of slavery, your antenna should go up and you should recognize what that means is that they reject Declaration of Independence. It's claimed that all men are created equal. They are very clear that that is a self-evident lie to quote one of them. And they, and America really becomes divided before the formal division when the Confederacy breaks away and forms its own country, the South breaks away and forms. That division was hardening long before the, it became formal. So in other words, America was not a democracy. Uh, that, that is a simplistic view 
of the country, actually, a revolutionary oligarchy developed within the bowels of the republic from within and then challenged for supremacy. So we ought to see this reconstruction as really the inflection point when the victors, the Republicans, and you can use a small r and a capital R, that is those who were part of the Republican Party, but remember, they called themselves Republicans cap with a capital R because they were Republicans with a small r. They believed in a Republican form of government and they opposed oligarchy. They chose that name an opposition, explicit opposition to what they knew their opponents were, which is oligarchs, principled oligarchs, which means rule of the few over the many, which means a rejection of everything that the American founders stood for. And unfortunately, our present view, popular present view, which is carries over even into scholarship, is that America is always a democracy and that uh, and we forget that both uh, black and white Americans in the American South at that time were a ruled class. And that, uh, you know, oligarchs, they in, in, in oligarchies, human beings are ranked. Right. You see uh gradations of human beings i mean in, in in any kind of regime which is not based on natural equality and you know you look at the old european monarchies they have earls and dukes and counts and then serfs and then you know free tradesmen you know and these are these distinctions are not just social they're political uh and in the american south you know americans both black and white were dominated in re and, and in rejection of the principles of 1776, I make a very clear and, and I would say, and, uh, you know, stance, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, in the, uh, for the union in my book, which I associate them, Lincoln and the Republicans and the union, I associate that with, they are the defenders of the principles of 1776. Uh, some of these folks who are kind of lost cause, neo-Confederate types, uh, they're gravely mistaken. They believe a lot of, I, th I would say, call it scholarly guff that was invented after the Civil War. Um, and uh, that uh, the, the sunny South was some kind of paradise for libertarianism. And that is absolute nonsense. You got to read the primary documents to see how nonsensical that really is. It was an oligarchy and the Americans, most Americans who were living there were a ruled class and they were crushed and their, and their liberty due to them as human beings and promised to them by the American constitution was denied. That's why we fought that war. Right. And so my next question builds on that. So so the South is an oligarchy rejecting the founding. What what are those founding principles that that you're alluding to? The, these principles of 1776. What is the the American regime built upon? Yeah, well, I really like the term that Michael Zuckert uses. He's a professor at Notre Dame. Um, he refers to the American Republic as a natural rights republic, that that's what the founders uh, really wanted to establish. That is a republic, which is defined, if we accept James Madison's definition or some of the other prominent American founders, mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, where the people are sovereign, this time by natural right. So in, in the ancient past, it was rule of the many, uh, uh, you know, and that um, based on the power of the men, the American Republic is different. The American founders, uh, they justify the rule of the many, not by power, but by right, which also means something else. It means that there are some things the majority cannot do because 
what gives them, what confers rightfulness on the rule of the majority is natural right. So that means that there are also some things that you cannot do without undermining the very moral basis of your own rule. So in other words, you can't enslave somebody. <laughs> it's wrong. And if you enslave somebody or if you deny them of their natural rights, then you have forfeited your right to majority rule because majority rule is based on, as Jefferson and Madison, they use this term, the lex majoris partis. The rule of the larger part is, they say, is the first rule, you know, uh, first law of nature and in, in governing assemblies of men, assemblages of men, mm -hmm. right? And that makes sense because if all are equal, then the greatest number the, you know, of opinions should, should govern. But you, you can't, there are some things you can't. So the American Republic is different and unique. And Madison says at the end of his life that its foundation in natural right is one of the two signal innovations and achievements of the Americans for which they ought to be emulated. Um, and the second one is federalism. Mm -hmm. um, and, or, well, actually, he says a division of power, and he means both, you know, among the great departments of government and uh, per, most particularly division between uh, state and national government. So those are the two signal achievements of the American founders and in constitutionalism, foundation and natural right separation of powers, and I especially emphasize federalism, the division of power between state and national government, because so few Americans today really understand what that is. There are several things that we have to remember about the founding. Number one is that probably half of the states at the time of the Constitution's framing would have been on their own, each on its own, the largest republic in human history. Publics had never been big. Uh, and so we ought to noodle on that one for a bit, right? I mean, when we're thinking about the foundings and we don't. The other thing that we ought to remember is that at the time of the American founding, I, you know, if, if you um, look at the revolutionary era sermons and encomia to the founding, and so on, Con contemporaneous speeches and writings. There's an incredible theme that we see that comes up over and over and over again, which uh, grabbed my attention, which is, you know, they see the American founding as some kind of break with a benighted past. You know, the Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new sacred order. Why is that sacred? Because their view of history is that in most times and in most places, human beings suffered from atrocities by their fellow human beings. And that most of the world was governed by tyrants, you know, monarchs and aristocrats and so on. And that that is accompanied by all kinds of atrocities. So I've taken upon myself to see is, and that here they are founding something that is going to break from that past where every human being's life is matters. And, and where human atrocities are no longer possible. So this foundation in natural right and a constitutional system that is faithful to that principle is going to break from that past. And that nation, James Wilson predicts, is going to also become immensely powerful because people are attracted to justice. Because when people see a just regime, a regime that actually can defend itself and is committed to justice, true justice, they will come a running. You'll get a wave of immigrants who want to be there. And they will build the country and they will have babies and they will generate wealth because they know they can keep it because the natural right to property is a natural right too. And the government is faithful to that. It will become rich, populous, and patriotic that people will love the laws because they understand that according to its own principles, 
that self-love reinforces law abiding, uh, you know, uh, the respect for the law. Right. And so you will see that uh, you will see goodness and justice become armed with power. And all of that are, are the kind of just fruits of a foundation in natural right and a constitutional system that is faithful to natural right. Mm -hmm. It looks like these guys actually have solved the problems that had plagued republicanism for millennia. And it looks like this experiment is actually going to work. And the Civil War Reconstruction period really puts it to the test. Right. And, and that's really where my next question comes in. And you already alluded to it. And I think that's where you're going is, so we have these foundational principles in a natural rights republicanism, as you said, but then, and you've mentioned the oligarchy. Let, let's talk a little bit more about that. What do you mean by this oligarchy? You mentioned inequality and a, a denial uh, of the ideals of the Declaration of Independence and, and these ranks in society. How, what are the characteristics of, of the oligarchy uh, and how yeah. do they deviate from the founding? Yeah. Well, first of all, oligarchy, if you, you know your kind of chart of regimes, you know, your classical chart of regimes, generally, you know, you have rule of one, few, and many, and then you have the good and the bad forms, which are determined by, are the rulers ruling for their, their own advantage or for the common good? And everybody in classical time generally accept that, I accept that. Aristotle accepts that division. Oligarchy is rule of the few ruling for its own advantage and not for the common good. Aristotle subdiv sort of classifies the regimes in another way too. And, and actually, um, he, he, it, basically all, all actual regimes tend in the oligarchic or democratic direction. That is the unjust few versus the unjust many. He's a very serious man, hard-headed man. <laughs> who sees reality and doesn't deny that most people want to rule for their own advantage. Democracy is the bad form of popular rule and oligarchy is the bad form of rule of the few and what they want to do. And now the Americans in 1776, they try to put something else into place. They try to put a just regime into place where the people are sovereign, but they're ruling for the common good and all these institutional devices are put into place to prevent them from turning bad and so on and hmm. oligarchy uh means rule of the few for the it, it, its own advantage and these kinds of people aristotle he talks at great length about them i mean they kind of they feel they they feel that they are superior to all and therefore since they are superior they are entitled to everything in society. You know, so the oligarchic, these oligarchs, uh, you see, they, they have roots that are deeper than American colonial, that are deeper than the American founding. We have to remember that the colonies in the Southern direction were basically followers of, you know, Anglicanism and and, uh, you know, and, and uh, these, you know, the monarchy, the old English, the English monarchy, I mean, there's a reason why the mascot for the University of Virginia is called the Cavaliers. They were not roundheads, okay? The New Englanders were. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, in what you see in during the revolutionary period is an upsurge and Southern fondness for Republicanism. They had despised, I mean, they had lived like aristocrats, like cavaliers. Then they start leaning toward, you see large numbers of the, the members of the aristoc Southern aristocratic elite leaning towards Republicanism. And I've seen this curious correspondence between especially Adams John Adams and these Southerners, I combed through all of the writings 
the papers of Southern statesmen looking for correspondence with New Englanders. And it's fascinating because what you see is that there, there are significant numbers of these Southerners who actually admire New England. They wanna copy New England Republicanism. They want to make a New England out of Virginia and North Carolina and so on and, they're, and Maryland and they're doing it in the early national period. And Adams, you know, like, if, if you, uh, you know, like God surveying his work in Genesis looks down upon the South with whom he has corresponded and helped build constitutions and declares his work good, right? He's been planting New England Republicanism in the South by educating them on constitutionalism and so on through the founding period. And, and we see in late life when he's corresponding with Hezekiah Niles about the revolution, Niles is asking him about the revolution. And the, we see in his reflections when he says that the real American revolution was this transformation when all Americans all of a sudden became republic, you know, but decided that this was correct and right. And basically what he's saying is everybody adopt, you know, the country moved towards adoption, full adoption of our New England <laughs> principles and way of life and system, which he had been teaching everybody. And, but which is very different from his hard, you know, his pessimism uh, in, in 1776 before independence when he's writing to Gates, Horatio General Gates and his wife and he's saying, boy, those Southerners, they're big impediments. The only way we're gonna pull this thing off is if we form a union based on Republican principles. That's the only way it's going to work. But those Southerners, they're standing in the way because, as he refers to them, the barons of the South. Well, what happens in the na early national period is that the, the South does start taking these strides. And it was plausible to believe that over time, the South would become like New England. and we have to remember that slavery, the institution of slavery, was the strongest, most significant institution that held up oligarchy. And everywhere slavery was planted, oligarchy, an oligarchic political system would sprout. Something goes wrong after the early national period. All of a sudden, the grandsons of the Southern founders, they switch. And they go back to, they stop Republican reform. And they end up saying, you know, slavery is actually pretty good. Unlike our Southern grandfathers who condemned slavery and said, we've got to end this thing, many of whom were slaveholders themselves, we think that it's a positive good and that the slaves are happy and they love our rule and that we are smarter, better, faster, stronger, more handsome. And therefore, we are entitled to rule not only over the slaves, but over everybody. Because these ruled whites, they look and they see this ruling class crushing out their American birthright, denying them everything, including, you know, economic, the ability to, 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 to climb the economic ladder, too. And they hate both slaves and masters. They know where the source of their oppression is. They know it's the slave institution, and it is. Mm -hmm. And so they they end up. And what do they see when they see when they see these plantations and see their would be overlords and so on? From their point of view, let me describe this. Let me be very careful now because I think their view is mistaken. But I want Americans to understand how and why they viewed the slaves as they did. First of all, they all have a distinctive appearance, which is different from everybody else. Third, second of all, they have been brought up in this institution, which as Franklin would say, debases them of their human character. In other words, you put any human being in that institution and you grind them down. I don't care what color they are, their foot size, their height, their 
you know, whatever, who their parentage and uh, what their parentage was, you put them in that institution, it will take half the man away, to quote Homer. And so what do these, what do these Southern, these ruled Southern whites see? Well, they see these foreigners who have been deprived and, and who seem to be inferior because in fact they've had their, they've been crushed. And so what do you start to, you can ruminate about biological origins. And also you've been raised in this system in which your share of rights is commensurate with wealth. And this is crucial because in a truly Republican society like Massachusetts, your rights are the same no matter what your wealth is. Wealth only buys you more comfort, mm -hmm. relatively more or less comfort relative to your wealth, but that's it. Your rights are it's the same, why? Because all men are created equal, equal with respect to what? With natural rights. And so laws that differentiate rights are unjust. But in the South, laws, you know, you give the guy who's wealthier, it gives the benefit of the law. This is how oligarchies always were. I mean, Charles Sumner even quotes this Venetian priest who is teaching oligarchs about the rules of justice, saying that, you know, if a poor man offends another poor man, you punish him mildly. If he offends one of the ruling class, you punish him with everything you've got. In other words, why? Because all men are not created equal. And Sumner says that's exactly what these Southerner, Southerners, how they think, how they believe, how they practice law. Okay. So, uh, I mean, this is the distinction between oligarchy and, um, and, and, you know, and Republicanism, which develops in the South in rejection of the American founding. I mean, that, that's just so comprehensive in terms of understanding oligarchy and, and how it played itself out with these differences over slavery and, and, and property and how racism developed. Uh, I'd like to dial in on that maybe a, a little bit briefly. Uh, how does racial slavery leave that lasting legacy of, of inequality, of violence, of denial of civil rights for, for Black Americans, not only during Reconstruction, uh, but well after, or really even through today? I would say that this is uh, those problems um, are the growing pains that our country had uh, uh, experienced when moving from oligarchy to republicanism. I say growing pains because, you know, in under oligarchy, human beings are ranked. And one of those ranks was demarcated by physical appearance, associated with physical appearance. But there were other ranks too. I mean, there were lesser nobility, so to speak, you know, the yeoman planters, and then there were who were white. And, and actually in Louisiana, some were black, by the way, they were Creoles. And then uh, there, and then there, there's, you know, the sort of white, and then these other white classes. So they're ranked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in societies in which, which is most human societies, that have ever been. And human beings are so ranked and when basically your natural rights are up for grabs because that political society, unlike a New England political society, does not uh, say, okay, all your rights are equal under positive law. Mm -hmm. When they don't do that, which is faithful to natural right, the idea that all people are equal with respect to natural rights. So therefore civil law reflecting that principle makes all equal under the law, all equal before the law. Well, you don't get that in oligarchic society. 
And so your rights are unstable. You're insecure. Well, how do you, you know, so now if you're rich or poor, that determines your rights. That determines what kind of expectations you can receive from the, you know, before the law. And what that means is that the way for you to get ahead, it's struggle, struggle, struggle. Economic struggle is not just a struggle for comfort. It's a struggle for, for rights. And, and really, struggle, that society is then defined by struggle. And you're struggling against other groups and you're struggling against other people. This is why dueling and murder become such a problem in the antebellum American South and the idea of a guy who can't back down from a fight won't resolve it with words. It's not because they were a warrior society. Actually, New England in the founding period is much more of a religious and warrior society than the South is. They become developed this reputation because of dueling and wanton murder. And so why? Because that's part of a society in which your rights are unstable. The only way to vindicate your rights is not by going in front of a tribunal. It's by exerting force, by personal struggle, by gaining wealth, by struggle. And so what happens when that oligarchy is, is struck by an exogenous force, which is the Union Army? What do you crack then crack open? The oligarchy, the ruling oligarchs had kept that society from destroying itself through power and for their control. Once you remove them and the Union Army comes and they say, hey, you're all equal now, you're all free, what did you do? You start struggling with each other. And that's where you get sort of post bellum violence. And that's all a part of this struggle. So it is a growing pain towards natural rights republicanism that was completely unexpected. Nobody really, I mean, I won't say completely unexpected. The oligarchs warned that this was going to happen. Um, and in fact, it does, uh, you know, all of discrimination, racism, you know, paramilitary violence. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan, it, you know, a, a report by Congress is unbelievable, and it's a limited study. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is all the kind of vestige and result of the old oligarchy. And what we what we see is that this movement, or you know, all those problems that we experience, is on route to you know, a regime that is more like a, a natural rights republic on the, the old New England model. So a just regime, one that recognizes rights, one that uh, recognizes equality and, and so forth. Right. Yes. Good. Okay, well, uh, and last question. So you write, the first principles of our government teach us that none may be exalted above another or debased beneath another with justice. And they prepare us to fly to the defense of each other's rights when any of us are threatened. And with knowledge of them, we'll be able to see each other in a more proper light and tighten our bonds of affection with each other. It's a really beautiful sentiment. And, and how do you think that we can accomplish this ideal uh, today in, in our somewhat divided world? Yeah, by understanding our past better. That's the short answer. Okay. All right. By understanding our past better. We as a country need to understand, and I'm going to put myself out there and be very clear. Those guys who founded this country were heroes. No apologies, no exceptions. They were heroes. And they should be, un and, and, you know, and the people who bravely stood up 
to protect their legacy in the mid 19th century, they were heroes. And the tendency of this country now to doubt that is not only unhealthy, it's also false. And it's misbegotten and wrong. What those people attempted was incredibly ambitious and incredibly brave. And they, they uh, and, and really I think if we understand what reconstruction really was and why even our American Civil War, we, uh, as I say, it ought to be understood in light of reconstruction and not the other way around that reconstruction is a moment when the American founding is tested. If we understood as a country what those forces were contending against each other, you know, a lot of the folks who cast, who doubt uh, the goodness of those folks in our past and their achievements, I think would, uh, would love this country and we would be united. They understood the truth a little bit better. Well, Forrest Neighbors, uh, your book is From Oligarchy to Republicanism, The Great Task of Reconstruction. And I want to thank you for joining us and for all of our audience who joined us as well. Uh, if you like this video, please be sure to subscribe to our channel and offer your comments below. We bring out new content on history and civics every Tuesday and Thursday, including primary source close reads, scholar talks like this one, uh, and also um, homework help videos. Uh, and so please also come join our conversations on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and join the lively conversation and learn more about our programs. Thank you very much.